At the end of this summer, when I realized we were going to be back doing this online kind of learning, and I started reaching out to filmmakers uh, to join our class, our next guest was one of the very first people I reached out to. Tom Cross is the Oscar-winning editor of Whiplash. But he's also been nominated for numerous other films for his amazing work in editing. Uh, films that you might recognize are La La Land, First Man, The Greatest Showman, and now he's currently editing the new James Bond movie uh, that's going to come out this year, finally. Um, guys, this is an important conversation about editing, and it's one that I'm extremely excited about because mainly because Whiplash is one of my favorite films of all time. It's in my top five. I love the movie, and I'm so excited that you guys are going to be able to see it and hear from the Oscar-winning editor. Guys, welcome to another edition of Film Nation. This time, the art, and it is an art, of editing with Tom Cross. All right, guys, welcome back to another class. And today, this is one of my, this is a special one for me. Uh, Tom Cross, editor, who is the Oscar winning editor of Whiplash, also uh, did La La Land, First Man, The Greatest Showman, and is currently working on the Bond number 25, No Time to Die, joins us today in class. Mr. Cross, thank you so much for being here and being a part of this discussion. Well, Chad, thanks for having me. Thanks for asking me. I'm happy to uh, happy happy to have this discussion. And, and in all honesty, you were one of the very first people I reached out into this uh, uh, this venue of creating a conversation with filmmakers because the work that you do as an editor is so important. But it's it's an unseen bit of work. So I'm I'm hoping this conversation with my guys will give us a little enlightenment on on the important craft that you do. Yeah. Yeah. All right, speaking of which, editing is a very crucial piece of the filmmaking process. And, but it's the story that often goes unnoticed by the audience. It, it's just something that is taken for granted the, the way the cuts just merge into the film. Um, what should my students know about the process and the art of editing? So next time that they see a film, they don't take their craft for granted. Right, well that's, Chad, that's a very good question. Because, you know, a lot of people, they see the credit film editor or edited by or editor. They don't really know what that means. And it is often thought of as a very technical role because it often has to do with uh, video software like iMovie or Premiere or Final Cut Pro or Avid. And it is for sure technical because it deals with um, putting pieces of picture and sound together in a technical way. But I think the thing that I think is that I would love for people to remember about film editing is that is, it is uh, a creative process. Um, you mentioned discussing the art of editing. It is an art. It is an art. It is a craft. And when I say creative, the reason I say that is because it is about putting the pieces together in a way that accomplishes many things. But the, one of the biggest things you want to accomplish with the construction of, of any motion picture is you want to accomplish uh, making people feel things. You want, to, you want to have it be emotional. And to, to do that requires, uh, my belief is, uh, artistry. Now, it's one thing to craft a magnificent action scene, a helicopter battle, or a car chase, or a fight scene. Like, it's one thing to, to put those pieces together so that it makes sense. But what I'm talking about is, and what most editors strive to do, is not just make sense of something so the audience understands what's happening, but you want to do it in an artistic way that, that enhances emotion that creates uh, suspense, that creates excitement. Um, you know, some of the best um, edited scenes are often 
well, it's complicated, but some of the best ones that we, we are aware of or that, that we see uh, that are apparent to our eyes are ones that are almost like, almost like visual choreography. They're like, they're like a dance. Um, and that's why, you know, editing that gets noticed is often very fast and very flashy. Um, all of that is important, but I should also stress that um, great editing is also at the same time can be invisible, you know, a small intimate scene, two people talking, um, how we cut from one shot to the other, how long we hold on a shot, that's all um, dictated in the editing room. That's not, that's not how it's shot. That's not how it is um, directed necessarily. Um, it is accomplished after you get all the material and you start putting it together. Um, those are the decisions that are made in the editing room. And, uh, and like I said, you know, um, great editing can be, um, you know, like a boxing scene from Rocky or Raging Bull. Um, it can also be a dialogue scene, just two people talking, a quiet scene from Schindler's List or, or, uh, or Hidden Figures or any, you know, any movie that has uh, great performances in it. Um, it can be editing that you don't notice. And so often it is editing you don't notice. And that's why film editors are often unsung because, you know, we don't, their great work is not immediately apparent. So, so just to sort of bring it back around, I would say if there was something I wanted people to know about what I do, it's that I, it is my job to work with filmmakers, to collaborate with them and to bring out um, the best in the material to create emotional responses. And, and we do that through the artistry. And let's look at two of your films that uh, we're going to look at Whiplash and La La Land in which you have these emotional responses that you edit almost, there's drastically different styles in each film, such as in Whiplash. Um, I know that you and Damien wanted the music scene to almost come like a boxing match with Raging Bull and the right. edits are this rapid cut. But then when uh, Andrew's talking to his girlfriend or with his father, it is a different pace of, and a different style of cutting. Uh, versus that's right when he's, when he's with Fletcher and when in La La Land when uh, Mia and Sebastian are at the beginning of their relationship and they're courting they're, you have them both in the same frame it's whimsical it's a magical right. and then when they have the fight uh, the, right. the, again the edits are very much rapid fast firing cuts they're not in the same picture together right. how, did you, how do you use your ability to take the shots and to create and generate those kinds of emotional responses? Well, it's, it's very, you know, it's, it takes a lot of time. You know, editing is, is a painstaking process. Mm -hmm. It takes time to put something together and then watch it and then see if, it, if it's giving you and viewers um, a certain sort of response then you go back and revise it. It's a very long process. It's, it's in a way, it's, it's like, you don't just do one and done. You don't just cut the scene together most often and have it be done. You know, it's something that is calibrated and you go back, you do your rough cut, you go, go, you might go away from it for a day. You might go away from, from that particular scene for a week and go back to it. It's, it's an, it's a very, um, it's like, it's like a, a marathon in a way, oh, wow. cutting a, editing a movie. And um, you don't usually, usually, sometimes, but usually you don't get it out of the gate. Usually it is something that is refined, refined, refined over and over again. And as you're doing that, you know, you start to get a feel for the overall, like not just this one scene, you start to feel where this one scene is in the whole movie. And the reason I bring up the whole movie is because if you can really get a good feel for the entire movie from start to finish, how the scenes are playing, you can then calibrate and adjust, um, you know, emotion in each section. So in other words, um, you know, I'm lucky because the filmmaker I often work with, Damien Chazelle, is a believer in director of La La Land and Whiplash and First Man. He's a believer in contrast. And that means that 
if he wants to have a very quickly cut musical scene like in at the end of Whiplash, he knows that it's going to seem even more visceral and exciting and fast if scenes around it are feel a little slower. And that's something that um, isn't always hard to tell when you're focused on the micro, you know, um, it, and that's where it's nice to be able to step back and, and sort of assess the whole movie and say, ah, okay, well, uh, I see this, this, this little scene or section. And by the way, it could be Whiplash, it could be James Bond, it could be any of those things where you're seeing something and you're like, wow, this scene is really fast and this is exciting. Well, if, if everything was fast and exciting, you'd start to become numb to it, you know? Right. And so as storytellers, as people who, um, you know, as an editor putting pieces together, I try to keep that in mind. So, you know, you bring up Whiplash and Whiplash, it was important to us to slow the pace down so that when the character of Andrew played by Miles Teller starts, um, starts dating, uh, you know, the character of Nicole, it was important to us that those scenes were, uh, were, were much more calm, were, were more uh, measured, were slower, less cutty. Um, it was important to kind of, you know, have a little bit of a reprieve from the practice scenes and from the rehearsal scenes of music with the character of Fletcher played by J.K. Simmons. Those scenes tended to be very cutty and very uh, fast and, uh, and we tried to cut those scenes so that, that you as a viewer had to kind of keep up with them. You know, we wanted to put you, the viewer, in the shoes of um, Andrew. We wanted to make you feel like you had to sort of, you know, keep up with what was what was going on. Like, was that a sheet, was that like a close-up of a piece of sheet music? You know, what was that? Did I just see someone, you know, like spit some spit something out of, you know, out of this musical instrument? What is that, you know? And so, um, we wanted to like put you in that body. And mm -hmm. the feeling was if we did that really fast, you would, you would, you, know, you as an audience member would start to feel that tension or that adrenaline. Okay. Um, but we didn't want that for the other scenes. So anyways, just to say that like, as an editor, we can, we have control over that, how scenes, how scenes play. Um, when scenes are, are shot, when they come out of the camera, you know, the actors might be performing something quickly but that doesn't mean it has to be cut quickly in fact we can as editors we can slow things down so we have a control over time and and the speed of things and the pace um you know in a way that really can influence how an audience feels can i ask real quick on the emotions just a, 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 when you're we yeah. talking about this a quick thought in my head came to me with, with the dinner scene in whiplash we're gonna use yes. family uh Miles Teller's character of Andrew, you know, he's excited to share about his good news. And then it just sort of like everybody else just glances over it. And it's like, yes, oh, yes. It's, it's cute. You, you play a little bit of music. Um, and you cut to his dad a couple times. Yeah. And, and as you can see, his dad's frustration getting with him as the conversation gets more heated. What, how hard is it to decide, all right, where am I going to throw just this little bit of clip just to, just to give that human element of his father or uh, his cousins and things like that? How, how much of a difficult battle is that to say, I need this, these many frames of that? You know, that's, that can be very challenging. Um, I should start by saying that something that, uh, another thing that's very important about film editing, film editing movies, is that film editors um it's the job of a film editor to to help support uh the actor's performances right so uh there are great performances that do come out of the camera you know when you get the footage you can you watch an actor a great actor you know um, like many of the actors I've worked with on movies, Ryan Gosling, J.K. Simmons, Christian Bale on Hostiles, Daniel Craig and Bond. Um, it's, it's amazing to watch their work as you get uh, the film, um, but it doesn't just end there. It's my job as an editor to 
pick, help work with the director to pick the right pieces that, that show them in their best light, to show the characters in the way that you want. When I say best light, not just flattering, but in the way that the character should be for the story. So that unto itself is a craft and that's an art. And so um, how difficult is it when you get a scene like the dinner table scene? I mean, it can be challenging. First, you, you really go through and you look at all the great pieces okay. of, of the, that's in the script and you pick out all the best moments. And you, know, you start building it around these great moments, these character moments. And you know how long you hold on a shot? It's it's kind of a gut response, you know. Okay. You 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 put it together and you watch it, and you start to try to get you start to you start to put yourself in that movie theater seat. You say, "Let me pretend that I'm in the theater and I'm watching this scene. Like, how does it make me feel? Do I do I feel like I'm I'm ha getting enough of this character, or if I'm watching a dinner table scene?" Do I ever feel like, wait a minute, where's this character? I haven't seen him in a long time. Is he even sitting at the table? You know, those are the things that you, you ask yourself. And you do that from a gut level. You try not to, I mean, you think about it, but it's more having to do with your gut than your, than your okay. brain. Yeah. So to generate that emotion on the screen, it's coming from your own emotion as a storyteller. That's right. And okay. so, so another, another, that's a great thing to mention because another thing I should point out in terms of film editing, and this goes for, this goes for, I think all filmmakers, I think that the best of, the best filmmakers and storytellers require, um, require people who are empathetic, require, require people uh, who are, who are good at, um, who are observant, who are good at reading emotion, who have a certain amount of emotional intelligence, because that's kind of what you're dealing with when you're telling a story. You want to maximize um, the emotion. If it's a comedy, you want to maximize the how funny it is. If it's a if it's if it's something that's supposed to make you sad, then you want to be keyed into that. And and so you it's not just a mechanical exercise of putting the pieces together. Like I said, um, you know, you have to be able to look at performances and judge that emotionally and decide, Oh, I think, I think this moment when this character tells this speech that's supposed to be moving, I think this take is, this take is more emotional because this take actually makes me feel like I want to cry. Okay. Whereas this take, doesn't quite do that, you know? So I think it requires some of that participation. Not only are you editing and cutting in emotions, but you're also editing a very visual story. So let's like look at First Man. And in First Man, you guys, get, you had on your desk one point, from what I understand, is 1.7 million feet of a film. Is that? That's right. Is it okay. Yeah. And the average film, when it's released, is 10,000 feet. Ish. Yeah, that yeah, that 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 could be. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's see. Just to say, you know, give her minus a couple yeah, thousand yeah, feet. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, exactly. to say, Under, you're, yeah. you're cutting right. from 1.7 million to. That's right. That's right. To a very yeah, yeah. to thousands. Yeah, right. Yeah. Than Twenty thousand um, or under. And 10, a lot yeah. of that was visual because I mean, yeah. it's a story. It's 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 a story of human achievement, but also technological yeah. achievement. So how That's do right. you how do you navigate when you have to me what would seem like yeah. a very overwhelming Yeah, and by the way, this? and by the way that's a, you know, we you know, in film and film editing, you know, we used to edit on film and uh that was the the measurement that we used. So 1.7 million feet. I mean, that's over 300 hours of material. Right. Uh just to put it in that way. Um it's, it's a lot of material. It's a lot of material. And, and what we've seen through the years is that people shoot more and more material. Um, is that you know, just because it's easier to shoot now in a digital age? I think it's several things. I think one, it's easier to shoot in the digital age. And I think also um, filmmakers want to protect themselves. You know, they want to, um, they want to cover themselves to make sure they have enough options because it's all about options uh, 
and um, sometimes some filmmakers overshoot, you know, um, but sometimes, you know, when you have a director like Damien Chazelle, it's both challenging, but also a pleasure. Like I'm lucky to get his material as an editor because he shoots so much beautiful, cinematic, um, striking material. Um, like it's, it's, it would be as if you were building a house out of, you know, the best materials. You are being provided the best materials. And someone says, you know, here's, here's, here's all the Italian marble that you would ever want. Now you get to make, you know, you get to make a tool shed with it or, or, you know, or a little house or something. And, you know, um, so it's, I feel, I feel very lucky in that way. I mean, in terms of whittling it down, you know, I think a lot of editors would say that, you know, how do you do that? Well, you, you do it really one cut at a time. It can be very overwhelming to have all this material, but um, you have to kind of go through it. You know, I'm, I'm motioning with my hands, like look through every piece, you know, we don't yeah. do it with our hands, but, but that's how it feels. You really okay. like go through every piece, every shot. I look at every foot of film shot, everything, because I do believe that an editor it's the editor's responsibility to to have seen everything that was shot, um, so that so that you so that I can I can know where everything is when I'm working with the filmmakers, but also I can I can I can say with certainty, no, I've seen everything, and I know that this is the best piece, or 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 if there's a question about where's this thing I shot, I'll have knowledge of of all of that. So um, so you know, you look through all of it and you make notes um, and editors do that in different ways, whether it's writing down or putting marks in, in your editing software. You know, I keep track of all the, all the pieces, all the different options, you know, I organize the material and, uh, and I don't do that alone. I have a whole crew of assistant editors who help me organize the material in the way that I think it'll it'll be best for me to put it together. And, uh, and you, so you do it, you do it a little bit at a time. And, and the bad thing about having a lot of material is you gotta, you know, it's a lot to go through. It's overwhelming and, and, and we have schedules. And so you have to, okay. you know, we're always racing with the clock. The good thing about it is that as a storyteller, it gives us more options. You know, if, if we need to go cut away from one angle because something isn't quite working, right. we've got another angle to go to, you know? And yeah. if that isn't working, we've got something else to go to. And so that's where all the pieces come from. And you just shared that you have uh, an, a talented group of assistant editors that work yes. with you. Um, so I'm gonna compare again two of your films. Uh, Whiplash, which was a $3 million independent film, Right. And now you're working on bond number 25, which is an estimated right. $250 million. Right. Uh, right. One, I would just think with the budget, uh, you would have a bigger team there to support you and kind of stuff. But yes. What are the differences in cutting uh, uh, or are there differences in cutting something that is a 3 million independent with a 250 million studio production? Um, there are a lot of differences. I mean, one of the differences you pointed out, which is, which is the personnel, you know, the amount of employees. Um, on, on James Bond, we had a, a very large crew of, of, of editors and assistant editors all working together. Um, and, you know, that's, that is necessary because of the amount of film that's shot, um, the degree of difficulty in terms of what the material is, how difficult will it be to put together? Um, it's it's almost like uh, this is kind of a very clumsy analogy, but it's it's almost like you know the difference in you know preparing to build you know like a fifty-story building versus uh, a ten-story building. You know, uh, in terms of the amount of contractors, so to speak, in terms of the amount of craftsmen, uh, craftspeople that you need. But, but I say it's a clumsy analogy because at the end of the day, um, they're, they're kind of the same. In other words, once the material is in front of the editor, um, it comes down to 
putting the pieces together in a way that is going to create emotion in a way that's dramatic um, in a way that serves the story. And in that way, it's the same. James Bond has characters and, you know, scenes that are dramatic and sad or exciting or funny or whatever. And the same with Whiplash, you know? And so, and here's the funny thing is that, you know, uh, they both, you know, may wind up on a 50 foot screen somewhere. And so whether one costs $3 million and one costs $250 million, they might appear on the same screen, you know? Um, so that's something that, so as much as they're very different, there is, there is stuff that's the same in a way. Well, the beauty of a big screen is it becomes so immersive. I mean, you have the, the screen yeah. that is overwhelming you. You have a sound that is all around you. So, I mean, it's right. it's it, it, where you don't, most people don't have it as a television. Now, since I teach mostly seniors, I will throw them under the bus here a little bit. <laughs> okay. when, when I give them an extent, like if they had a deadline of a project and I'm like, all right, guys, uh, due to bad weather or whatever, you got an extra week. They are because a lot of them are procrastinators. They're like, yes, yeah. uh, yep. When COVID came and and No Time to Die was extended, were yeah. you were you were you like, oh, thank goodness, or 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 were you? You know, well, that's yeah, that's a good question. I mean, when COVID came, we were uh, we didn't in some ways for the most part we didn't benefit from more time. When COVID happened, we were pretty much done editing the movie. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, it, it, you know, the reason we were done is because our original release date, since I got on, was um, supposed to be in April. Right. I guess that would be April 2020. I'm losing right. track of uh, years now, but <laughs> I think it was supposed to be April 2020. So I finished working on the movie in March. Oh, mid wow. to yeah mid march and so we were pretty much when we heard about covid and things were starting to lock down we were already on our way to the finish line so we just com continued and and by the way they i think as they start as the world started to lock down they did move the release date um later I think it was then till November 2020. They moved it later, but right. but they still we were so we were we were at the finish line anyway. So we just kind of finished. I think they took a little extra time to uh, refine some CG and visual effect shots. Okay. But in terms of my job, putting the piece together, and I mean that was done. We okay. Yeah. So um, you know and. And by the way, I, I, I actually, a lot of people reach out to me whenever they hear the new updated news on the release date changing. Oh, it's not coming out. It's wait another six months or a year. Um, people are always sending me their condolences about that. But I actually like that it's moving later because I would like more people to go to the movie theaters when it's safer to do it, you know? Okay. Um, so I, I'd prefer, I prefer kicking that can down the road just because then I think more people will be able to experience it on the big screen. Well, so. I mean, as you said, you, 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 your primary goal is to make it for the people that are going to the big screen to watch it. So why not kick That's it down right. the road? So. Why not? Yeah. So. All right. Now you've mentioned several times, uh, the director that you've had a strong partnership with, with Damien, uh, you've worked uh, yeah. with him on three different films. Uh, Whiplash, La La Land, First Man. Uh, and it's one thing that I, I saw in, uh, is that one reason why you feel like you have a strong partnership with him is one, you, you both have a, a nerdy love of film together. Yes. But, but two, you just, you just, you feel like, you, it seems from my understanding, you guys just are able to relate and communicate with each other really well. Yeah. Um, most of my guys are not going to go into the filmmaking industry. Right, right. Uh, they're just going to go into a business world. And uh, right. so Damien is, in that since your boss still as a director, yeah. um, right. what bit of advice would you give uh, to my guys who are going to go into the business world of how to develop and build a, a long lasting relationship with your boss? Yeah, I think that, I think that no matter what you do, um, I, my experience tells me that if, if you are someone who people like to spend time with, mm -hmm. if you have a good bedside manner, 
Um, if, if, if you, if you get along with people, um, that goes a long way. Uh, I mean, I think that's actually an understatement and what I do, it, it goes a, a long, long way. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really key. Um, you know, bring it back around to what I do, uh, as a film editor, I am alone with my crew when they're shooting the movie. I get pieces and I'm putting it together. I'm working, I, I have, I, I'm not completely alone because in other offices with me, I have my crew of assistant editors and visual effects editors and sound people, and we're all working together, but I'm, I'm, I'm without a director. I'm, my job is to put things together as they're shooting it. I try to keep up to camera so that if I see a problem, I can alert them while okay. they're still shooting so they can oh, maybe, wow. you know, um, maybe they can, they can change a piece or get, or get a piece before the actors go away, before the sets are all struck and, oh, okay. and, and broken down. I mean, that's something that is, they've been doing in the studio since the old movie studio days. Um, they have an editor putting it together while they're shooting. And the idea is, um, you know, when you're finished shooting, uh, you present a first cut of the movie a week after the shooting is done. Uh -huh. And and then you start working with the director. So, uh, so where I'm going with this is that for part of the process, the first part of the process, I am essentially alone. Um, but then for the next part of the process, I am in a room, usually in a room with, uh, depending on the directors, but like with Damien, we're, I'm in a room with him, you know, for, for 12 or more hours a day. And it's wow. just me and the director. And we're looking at the scenes, looking at the pieces, putting it together uh, and collaborating. And, you know, I like to think that, you know, our personalities kind of mesh okay. so that we can spend 12 hours a day. And, you know, I know, I know a lot of film editors who are brilliant film editors who are great at putting scenes together. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them don't always have a good bedside manner. Some of them aren't necessarily good with people. And so maybe as editors, they work best if you just give them a pile of film and say, go and work on this and work on your own and come back to me. You know, but that doesn't always work because often filmmakers these days, great filmmakers want to want to work directly, be hands-on, um, such as Damien Chazelle. He is very, um, he's very hands-on. And I'm lucky to get to work with such a, a brilliant storyteller. And, uh, uh, but again, part of that is, is because we mesh together. I mean, it, when we talk about an editor-director collaboration, it's almost like, it's almost like a marriage in a way. Okay you know, and I think that's, that's how you have to think of it, a creative marriage. And if, if you're not, you know, it's going to be a messy divorce if, if you're not well matched. So I think that that applies to, um, I think that applies to a lot of people in the workforce who work to work together. You have to work with other people usually. And, um, and, you know, I got some advice early on from, from uh, an editor I worked with. And he said, you know, uh, you know, people always seem to really like him and love him. They was, he was a very warm, gregarious person. And I, I remember talking to him about that. And he said, well, you know, like if, if they like me, you know, if, if they like me, then, you know, when I make a mistake, they're gonna say, oh, you know, yeah, we, we, you know, we got a little thing, you know, but, but he's fixing it, you know, right. If they don't like him, then he can do no right, you know? Okay. And so I always try to remember that, um, you know, that goes a long way. If, uh, if, if people don't like you, you get, you get a target on your back, you know? Right. Um, if they do like you, you, you get a pass sometimes. So. And that's an important pass. It's a very it is. It is. All right, Tom, thank you so much for sharing the art and the craft of editing. Um, we've now come to a segment that is known as five quick questions. It's just a little 
rapport building game that we're going to do here. Uh, I will ask you a question. You come up with the quickest response that you can. Are you ready to go? I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. I don't know how good I'll be, but I'm, re I'm ready to try. All right. Well, away we go. Uh, question one. Now you won an Oscar for your work with Whiplash and you were, as you were up on a stage, you were able to thank everyone that was responsible for getting you there. And then the music started playing and you were cut off. Now I do not have an orchestra here. So what would you have added to your acceptance speech if you had had more time? Oh, uh, you know, just that I, you know, if I had more time and I could do it, I would bring my wife up on stage uh, because, you know, my the love I have for my wife and my family, that, you know, that enables me to do what I do. To, that enables me to do film editing, which is what I love. And, uh, you know, when, when, when people work in the film business, you know, uh, it's long hours, oh. it's hard work, and we have to go on this hard, cha often challenging journey, but our families go along with us, you know? Okay. And, um, and they deserve a lot of the credit for that. Well, very nice. Question two. Now, you're a self-proclaimed film nerd, uh, and so you would know that there are certain films that should never, ever be touched. You know, do not remake these movies. But, hypothetically, I'm going to give you four films, and you have to remake, recut one of them. Uh, oh, again, boy. You, you shouldn't ever recut any of these, but you, you, you got to recut. So you have every bit of film available to you. So here's, here's the four. You tell me which one you would choose and why have The Godfather, Jaws, Vertigo, or The Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, all of those are amazing motion pictures. They're amazing, uh, they're amazing movies. Um, so my first answer, which is, which is kind of won't be accepted, but my first answer would be that I wouldn't touch any of them because I, I feel like they were all um, brilliant products of their time and right. and are also timeless uh, also. Um, but, you know, uh, you just listed uh, a chunk of movies that are literally on my, on my top, you know, okay. 20 list. Um, so I'd have to pick the, pick the one that is, is lower down on the list and that would be Shawshank Redemption because the Jaws, uh, you know, is a masterpiece that I, I, I can't imagine changing. Edited by a brilliant film editor, Verna Fields, won an Oscar for that movie. Um, right. And of course, directed by Steven Spielberg, who, was, uh, who I was lucky enough to, to um, meet and work with a little bit on First Man. He was a producer. Um, it's a little bit like meeting your maker. Uh, in a good way, in, a, in an awe-inspiring way, because yeah. I love I love his work and think he's um, a kind, beautiful person. Um, the Godfather, I think, is is a utterly brilliant movie um, and a very dark one, but done in, a, in told in just a beautiful, elegant way. Yeah. And you know, I'm a big fan of Hitchcock, so Vertigo is is really. Uh, a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic example of his work. It's and it's also a convergence of something very personal to him. This this character is obsessed with this woman, but it's also you know that converges with uh, with mainstream Hollywood because it's a big, old fashioned you know uh, studio movie. You know, it's right. not just an art film. Um, and then what's the other one I'm leaving out? I'm le am I leaving out another one? You got you went through them all. So because you chose Shawshank, you're, yeah, what, you're not jo you're Godfather. Not doing Jaws, did you list four not, or five? I listed four. I listed oh well, there you go. Then okay. then Shawshank Shawshank is a great movie too. But I guess that's the that would have to be the outlier just because only because the other three you know are are just uh, so so burned into my into my well I point up here but I was going to say burned into my heart. Well, there you go. Well, thank you for not touching any of them. And, and no studio <laughs> should never, never touch any of them like that. I agree. Uh, number three, um, 
what movies would you suggest my students watch for a good understanding of the art of editing? Hmm. I've thought about this a lot and, and it's been very hard for me to come up with, uh, come up with good answers. Um, that's a tough one for me. I mean, uh, I don't know that I could come up with one, you know? Okay, um, got a couple of them? Yeah, I got a couple of them. I mean, um, you know, the first one I think that comes to mind would probably be, uh, geez, this is, I mean, you know what, in no particular order, I shouldn't say the first one, I should say in no particular order, um, I would say the Bob Fosse movie, All That Jazz, starring Roy Scheider, uh, edited by the great Alan Heim, who won an Academy Award for the editing of that. It's a musical, um, and it is it is just a great example of, uh, of creating an editorial style uh, to tell your story. Um, I don't know. I, it's it's hard for me to it's hard for me to uh, to to pick out because it seems so because it's so important to me editing. Um, again, in no particular order, uh, I would I would pick the movie JFK, okay. Oliver Stone's JFK, edited Academy Award winning editing by uh, Joe Hutching and Pietro Scalia, two two multiple Oscar winners, um, great editors. And what I think is really notable about that movie is that it is uh, like a collage, visual collage. It's yes. told with um, with different pieces of film, some shot on 35 millimeters, some shot on eight millimeter, you know, video. It's, it's, it's a visual collage and it's all put together in a way to create drama and to create suspense. Um, and, and it's a style that has since been imitated and has become very, you see that style on, on, um, true crime television, you know, uh -huh. um, and this, this, this mixing of, of archival footage, documentary footage, but then reenacted footage. And it's all pieced together in a way that, that, um, gives each piece equal weight. In other words, uh, when you're watching the movie, I feel that um, it isn't a matter of me seeing archival footage and feeling that that's real. And then when I see the reenactment, I'm less engaged and it doesn't feel like it has the emotional weight. It's edited in a way that gives all those pieces equal amount of weight. And uh, I think that's notable. And, you know, another favorite of mine, um, I could go on for hours, but another favorite of mine would be Raging Bull. Okay. Uh, the, the Martin Scorsese movie edited by the great Thelma Schoonmaker. Um, and I think that's a, a great, uh, a great film because that has great contrast. It has, um, it has great emotional scenes, uh, that are, you know, that are slow moving and brooding and, and, uh, and sort of, uh, meditative. And then it's punctuated by quick violent cuts and boxing scenes and right. so i think it's a great that's another great example so again i i could i could go on but those those are the top of my head well there we go and and all great movies and and right that you know which you talked about raging bull with the boxing team what made it so fascinating is because it, it, it's pacing it is so chaotic at the same time which probably a boxing match would be if you're actually question yeah. number four you have a disagreement with the director on where to make the cut and you know you're right. You know mm -hmm. you're right. So yeah. do you A, bribe them with a jelly donut, it's a jelly, uh, B, blackmail them with their sixth grade photo from their marching band uniform days, uh, C, give them a technical argument that is so long and painful that it, they, it just, it'd be easier to just in the discussion say yeah sure you're right or d something else <laughs> probably all those those three options are all very uh there's an argument to made to be made for those first three i probably for me personally my style uh, style of working i probably wouldn't pick any of the three i'd i'd pick uh i'd pick number four or d i would pick uh i'd pick none of the above I think that whenever I disagree with the director on something, 
I try not to, I, I like to be uh, truthful and direct about my opinion. If I feel strongly about something, mm -hmm. I'll say, I don't think that cuts a good idea, but I won't press it. I won't press it because I don't feel like the process is served by uh, anything becoming personal or, um, or where my ego mm. uh, overrides uh, everything else, you know? Okay. And so, you know, I will, with the filmmakers I collaborate with, I'll, I'll kind of say it once, maybe I'll say it a couple more than once, I'll say it a couple times, but I don't push it too hard. Okay. And my belief is, um, my thought is, you know what, okay, you wanna, I don't agree with you, but let's keep the cut the way it is and let's screen the rough cut. Let's, let's get a bunch of people in for a little friends and family screen. Let's run it for them, which we do a lot, by the way, when we're working on a movie before we finish, we screen it for friends, private screenings right. to get a feel for how it's going. We do that all the time. That's a great thing for all filmmakers to do. So I might kick it, kick that can down the road and say, you know what, let's see how it plays with an audience, you know? Okay. And then when we see it play with an audience, often it'll come back and uh, and the director will be like, you know what, yeah, it felt kind of weird. I think you're right, we should do what you said. Or I might say, you know what, I was wrong. And it, it actually feels completely fine with the audience. They reacted fine and there you go. So, you know, when you're putting a movie together, how many thousands of decisions do you have to make? So many of them. So many cuts, so many decisions. Do you put the sound effect here? Is the sound effect, do you do it loud? Do you do it soft? Where do you put the music? What music? So many decisions that you have to think of, like I said, it's like a marathon. You know, you gotta pick your battles. Okay. And you can't, it's not about, it's not about winning all of them. And you have to have faith that, as long as you have faith that your opinion is valued, I don't need to prove anything. It's all about the movie. Is this best for the movie and the story? And you know, I'll I'll give my opinion and and trust that it'll work itself out in the process. All right. Fifth question, final of the of the five quick questions. It's it's going to ask for you to go to your gut reaction again. You don't really have time to process this. This is a oh cage boy. fight of editing. So. Mm -hmm. You have, we have narrowed it down to a final four. So we're gonna have a two versus two and then the winners go against each other. All right, mm -hmm. so the first, on the first bracket, you have Apoc Apocalypse Now's ceiling fan transition to the helicopters mm -hmm. versus uh, the two, uh, 2001's bone toss into the air. Mm. Which one is, which one is, uh, which one do I pick? Yep. Mm. Well, that, by the way, this is, this is me being long-winded and giving my little preamble again. Uh, both movies mean a lot to me. Uh, Apocalypse Now, my mother, my mother, uh, my late mother, uh, you know, was Vietnamese. So uh, Apocalypse Now was, was, was uh, an early R-rated movie my parents took me to see. They were very strict about it when I was a kid. Okay. Uh, but I remember seeing that growing up. So it was an important movie to me. I love it. And 2001 is, you know, that's a, a classic. So, um, so that's a little bit of, uh, you know, which it's like killing your babies, you know, like Sophie's Choice, which one do you do? I mean, I probably, I probably pick 2001 just because it's, it's a sharper, um, more iconic uh, example that I think really illustrates an interesting um, piece of editing. Okay. Um, and it's and it's one that you could really show a lot of people and they, they, they could probably um, understand it and see it. I think Apocalypse Now, the, the one you're talking about, the ceiling fan and this, this sonic uh, helicopter thing, I think it's so beautifully, elegantly, um, elegantly done. Uh, to me, it's iconic. I think it's something that um, that a lot of people might take for granted and not notice. Right. So, um, in that way, I guess I, I sort of like I, I grab the other one. But okay. um, they're both brilliant, beautiful examples. So now we're going to go on to the other side of the bracket. 
All right, we have Lawrence of Arabia's match blowout scene. Right. Versus Saving Private Ryan's J cut from the cemetery to the uh, opening of the Normandy Beach. Right, right, right. Uh, well, you know, you, you again, <laughs> Sophie's Choice, an abundance of riches. I mean, both of them are so, um, you know, that's what the, these examples you bring up. I mean, that's where that's where the art of it comes in. You know, those are those are artful edits. And, um, you know, where one thing cuts to the other and it really you feel it in your gut, but then you also feel it in your mind. It makes right. you think, you know, and um, and in there in the case of of both of them, they're, they're surprises. You're not expecting that to happen. You're not expecting the next shot to be what it is. Right. And, and it's something where, um, you know, the first shot might be beautiful, the second shot might be beautiful, but it's really how they're cut together, the sum of their parts that is, is full, kind of the full deal, the full Monty. So in both cases, um, I mean, you know, I would probably have to pick if we're picking the, the which one, you know, if you have to pick a, a, a favorite out of the bunch, I think you got to pick the Lawrence of Arabia because that cut is is so iconic. I mean, that that blowing on the match and then going to this this uh, this landscape, you know, with the with the sun setting. I can't even remember if it's setting or rising, but it's this fiery red, you know, um, and, you know, that is just that is just iconic. Um, and yeah, and of course, I'm, I'm an editor buff, so I know that's edited by Ann Coates, uh, the late Ann Coates, Oscar winning editor, uh, David Lean's editor, who um, was a brilliant editor. She also edited the movie Out of Sight, the Steven Soderbergh movie with right. Clooney, right. Um, which is brilliantly edited. But um, so she, she was around cutting Lawrence of Arabia, and then how many decades later she was. That's she late was, 90s ish. So. Yeah. Doing All right, so now you have your, your bracket where you have 2001 Space Odyssey versus Lawrence of Arabia. Who are you choosing and why? Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, that's a tough one. You know, that's a tough one because they're both, if I could put them both in, in, in the goodies basket, I would because I feel like one really plays, I mean, even though I talked about, you know, hitting you in the gut, but also up here. I mean, the Lawrence of Arabia one plays, I feel like more to a feeling, more to your gut, which is, uh, you know, you feel, you feel the, um, the energy of that little flame. You feel it sort of dispersing on the next shot in a way, you know, it's, uh, um, it's more of a gut thing. Whereas the Kubrick, the Stanley Kubrick with the bone, that's a very intellectual thing. The idea of, of this tool that this, this ape uses, you know, evolves instantly, instantly evolves into uh, basically a machine, a tool that is, is a modern uh, interpretation of the bone. It's, it's a tool of, of the future, a spaceship. Okay. So um, in a way, uh, in a way, that bone cut has more, I guess it could be argued it has more value. You get more bang for your buck because um, there's more to there's more to think about. But but then again, you know, I'm going to I'm going to go back and forth on that. I'll probably pick the bone, but I would go back and forth because because there could be an argument made that that, you know, it, it does a good cut require you to just think more? I don't know. But uh, but I'll just say that 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 bone cut uh has has a lot of weight to it so maybe that one all right well guys we're, you, you gotta now watch 2001 a space odyssey tom cross you have played five questions you have shared a lot of great insight with us thank you so much for being a part of our class today. i i appreciate it i love those five questions you caught me off guard and and uh I almost feel like I got to go back and do my homework and come back and answer them again, <laughs> answer them better. But it was, that was awesome. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, so much for this wonderful conversation and letting us know the art of editing. Uh, guys, I hope you understand. 
how much work goes into creating the films that you love to watch. It's one of the reasons why you love it is because of this editor. Guys, as always, remain awesome, be nice, stay safe, and I will see you soon. I'm gonna try this again. I really, I, I, I'm bad at this. One, one, two, three, four. See you later, guys. Little trouble there. You're rushing. Here we go. Five, six, and. Were you rushing or were you dragging? I, I don't know. If you deliberately sabotage my band, I will gut you like a pig. Oh, my dear God. Are you one of those single-tier people?